On a cold day in November 1930, two-year-old Mary Agnes Maroney vanished without a trace in the bustling city of Chicago. For 93 years, her disappearance left authorities puzzled and family members heartbroken. This is a perplexing case of a long-lost child. The mysterious disappearance of Mary Agnes Maroney made international headlines for almost a century. False leads and useless findings failed to bring the little girl home, but after decades, the pieces of the puzzle began to align. Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we delve into the depths of solved and unsolved cases, brooding mysteries, and haunting tales that will keep you up at night. In today's video, we will cover the decades-long search for two-year-old Mary Agnes Maroney, who vanished from her Chicago home in 1930 by a mysterious woman never to be seen again. From mysterious letters to reported sightings and many DNA testings, the case of Mary Agnes Maroney defied resolution until 2023 when a Californian woman came forward who held the key to the decades-old mystery. Join us as we uncover the shocking truth behind Mary's disappearance and the unexpected turn of events that led to her case finally being solved. Mary Agnes Maroney was born on May 9, 1928, in Chicago, Illinois, to Catherine and Michael Maroney, a family struggling to make ends meet in the grips of poverty during the Great Depression. She also had a younger sister, Anastasia, who was only 11 months old. She resided with her family in a second-floor apartment above a grocery store at 5200 Wentworth Avenue. Michael's meager income of just $15 per week was earned by distributing handbills. Times were tough for the Maronis. In the midst of their struggle, the family story caught the attention of a relative of Catherine's. This relative took the initiative to contact a welfare agency, which resulted in an advertisement being published about their struggle to make ends meet. On Wednesday night, May 13, 1930, Edgar Gilpin, a self-described male nurse and philanthropist, responded to the advertisement. He offered Michael, the father, a suit and a pair of shoes as assistance. The family took the offer through the agency as the addresses of families in need were disclosed to the public. However, through a minor slip-up, the Maroney family's address was leaked to a mysterious woman. Little did they know that this seemingly tiny error would set off a chain of tragedy that would forever change their lives. The following day, on May 14, 1930, 17-year-old Catherine was at home alone with Mary Agnes and Anastasia. While she was scrubbing the floor, she heard a knock at the door. Catherine answered the door to find a well-dressed woman who claimed to be a representative of the social worker named Mrs. Henderson who had come across the Maroney family's advertisement for assistance. She had just purchased groceries worth $2.55 from the grocery store downstairs and brought them inside. As Catherine shared their family's struggle with the woman, Mary Agnes, who was typically shy, warmed up to her quickly. The woman listened attentively and appeared quite friendly and eager to help. She mentioned that her elderly husband had passed away, leaving her with a considerable sum of fortune. She also said she wanted to have a child like Mary Agnes. She then asked to take Mary Agnes to California temporarily, assuring Catherine that the young girl would be as fat as a butterball. Catherine couldn't shake off the unease. She refused the woman's unexpected offer, and the woman politely accepted the mother's decision. She reassured Catherine that she would return the next day. When Catherine asked for her name, the woman hesitantly said it was Julia Otis. Before leaving, Julia handed Catherine two dollars and two books as a gesture of support. The next day, May 15th, Julia Otis returned to the Maroney residence despite the gloomy weather. This time, she brought new baby clothes for Catherine, who was expecting her third child at the time. It was later discovered that Julia had purchased these clothes from a department store using a new $50 bill. She said she had secured a more promising job for Mary Agnes's father and offered to take Mary Agnes to a nearby store for new clothes and shoes. Catherine, grateful for the woman's generosity, had believed her to be a blessing, reluctantly agreed to let Mary Agnes go with her. Despite little Mary's tears and tantrums, Julia Otis took her away and left. 
the two were never seen again. Amidst the desperate search for their beloved daughter, Catherine and Michael turned to the police for help. Despite their efforts, no trace was found. During that same night, an elderly and poorly dressed man arrived at the Moroni residence who also pretended to be a welfare worker. Catherine, feeling uneasy about his presence, contacted the police to report him. The man attempted to prevent her from making the call, but eventually ran away when he failed to do so. He was never located or identified. Catherine provided a description of Julia Otis as a pleasant and attractive woman, approximately 22 years old, standing around 5 foot 2 and weighing 125 pounds. She had protruding teeth and spoke with a cultured voice. At their last encounter, Julia was wearing a gray suit, a gray lace hat, a pearl necklace, and a jeweled wristwatch. The next day, on May 16th, a letter from Julia Otis arrived at approximately 8 in the evening. The letter was written on stationary paper and had a postmark indicating it was sent at 4.30 p.m. It was sent through special delivery and enclosed a $5 bill. The letter read, Please don't be alarmed. I have taken your little girl to California with me. I have hired a special nurse to care for her. We'll be back in two months. By that time, you will be on your feet again and will be able to care for her. She didn't even cry a bit. She is outfitted like a princess. In the meantime, I'll help all I can to get you on your feet. Don't worry about anything else. When you get this letter, we'll be on our way already. As ever, Julia Otis. Upon examining the letter, the authorities discovered that there were deliberate attempts to appear illiterate in the writing. Could the person who wrote the letter have been intentionally disguising their true level of education? As news of the letter spread, witnesses came forward with accounts of a woman who matched the description of Julia. The woman was seen at a store with a young girl who resembled Mary Agnes. The woman was observed dictating a letter to a store worker. Two weeks later, the Maronis received a second letter from a woman named Alice Henderson who claimed to be the cousin of Julia Otis. In her letter, Alice said that Julia had lost both her husband and her baby the previous year. Because of her tragic loss, she had been love-hungry. Alice said she hoped that Julia would come to her senses and return Mary Agnes. She never wrote the family again. Authorities eventually discovered that the handwriting in both letters matched. On May 19th, four days after Mary Agnes' abduction, Catherine Maroney took matters into her own hands and obtained a warrant from a judge charging Julia Otis with the kidnapping of her daughter. The abduction of Mary Agnes Maroney by this mysterious woman captivated the attention of both the public and law enforcement. The police scoured Chicago's railway stations hoping to find any trace of the two boarding a train. However, it was as if the two vanished into thin air. On July 23, 1931, a sighting of a girl matching the description of Mary Agnes was reported in Rockford, Illinois. An elderly Native American woman named Martha Thompson was seen pushing a cart with a three-year-old white girl who had features similar to Mary Agnes, tan skin, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Martha said that the girl had been abandoned by her mother, Florence Fuller, and she was going to join a circus with the child. When the Maronis were informed and arrived to identify the girl, Catherine said that the little girl was not Mary Agnes. Catherine carefully examined the girl, she checked her teeth and her body and determined that she was not her daughter. Both parents were heartbroken. One distinguishing factor was that Mary Agnes had a red mark on her arm, which the girl in Rockford did not have. As the investigation into Mary Agnes's disappearance provided no significant leads, the case eventually went cold. In the years that followed, the Moroni family welcomed Mary Agnes's sister Catherine into the world. Subsequently, they were blessed with the births of five boys named Michael Jr., Patrick, George, Harold, and William. The media periodically featured stories about Mary Agnes, especially when the other children went missing, ensuring that her name remained in public. Chicago Daily News reporter Eden Wright came across a photo of the Moroni family and made a significant observation. All family members resembled each other, he noted. Sensing an opportunity, the Chicago Daily News collaborated with a California newspaper to publish pictures of the Moroni family, hoping that someone would recognize Mary Agnes. In 1952, a man named Everett McClelland came forward. 
The Californian man claimed that one of Mary Agnes's sisters, Anastasia, bore such a striking resemblance to his wife that it could have been her photograph. The woman was 24-year-old Mary McClelland, who had been adopted by a couple named Charles and Nora Beck in 1930. Mary McClelland's teeth, blood and skull type, fingerprints and handprints appeared to match those of Mary Agnes. McClelland lacked two things. Mary Agnes was born a year later, and McClelland did not have Mary Agnes's distinct hernia scar that she got from a medical operation. On September 4, 1952, the newspaper set up a meeting between Mary McClelland and Catherine. But to everyone's disappointment, Catherine insisted that Mary McClelland was not her long-lost daughter. Over the years, the women grew very close. Eventually, a DNA test conducted in 2008 following Mary McClellan's passing confirmed that she was indeed not Mary Agnes. The devastating loss of Mary Agnes had a profound impact on her parents, Catherine and Michael. Michael's life came to an end in 1957 at the age of 58, leaving behind an extraordinary pain that was caused by his beloved daughter that was forever gone. Catherine, consumed by the agony of her daughter's disappearance, suffered from depression that haunted her for years. Catherine also passed away in 1962 at the young age of 49, carrying the weight of her grief until the end. The case of Mary Agnes remained an unsolved mystery for nearly a century. In 2022, the investigation into Mary Agnes' disappearance took a significant turn when Cook County Sheriff's Detective Jose Rodriguez commenced his investigation and reached out to Terry Arnold, the daughter of a woman whom he believed was the long-lost Mary Agnes Maroney. Based on DNA evidence, Detective Rodriguez suspected that Terry's mother might actually be Mary Agnes. Initially, when the detective approached Terry Arnold with his theory regarding Jeanette Burchard's potential identity as Mary Agnes Maroney, Terry was skeptical and didn't believe the detective's hypothesis. She pointed out that her mother lacked Mary Agnes' birthmark and other distinctive characteristics. However, to put the theory to rest and to provide definitive evidence, Terry agreed to undergo a commercial DNA test. The results of the test were received on October 28, 2022 and revealed a shocking revelation. Contrary to Terry's Polish heritage, her genetic makeup predominantly reflected Irish ancestry, a significant similarity shared with the Moroni family. The DNA test also proved that Terry Arnold is the first-line cousin of the surviving members of the Maroney family. This unexpected connection further fueled the belief that the woman was, in fact, Mary Agnes Maroney. But who was she? Jeanette Burchard, who was raised by Jeanette Celeric Darris Anderson and her stepfather, Frank Darris, had been informed by her family that she was born on April 14, 1928. During his investigation, Detective Rodriguez did not uncover any evident abnormalities in Burchard's family. However, Terry shared an important clue. Her step-grandfather, Frank Darris, once informed Jeanette Burchard that the woman who raised her was not her biological mother. Terry also said that her mother even reached out to her cousins in Chicago in an attempt to shed light on her true origins, but they claimed to have no knowledge of the situation. What was later revealed, however, was that the woman who raised Jeanette had a brief marriage to a man named John Fahey before marrying Frank Darris. According to a 1930 census record, Fahey and the woman lived together in Chicago at that time, along with Jeanette Burchard. After marrying Darris, the family relocated to Virginia around 1934 and later moved to Florida during World War II. In the 1940s, she married Edward Jennings and together they had two children. Barbara Joan Jennings and Edward Clifton Jennings Jr. Jeanette began working as a nurse and in 1957 she gave birth to her third child, Terry Arnold. Some decades later, she married for a second time to Earl Burchard. Jeanette throughout her life was a devoted fan of the Miami Dolphins, showing her support for the team from its founding in 1966. In addition to her profession as a nurse, Jeanette had a deep love for animals, particularly dogs and cats. She also had a passion for opera, with a special fondness for Madame Butterfly. Terry Arnold revealed that her mother would occasionally visit Chicago, with the last visit likely occurring between 1989 and 1995, possibly for a funeral. In 2003, she passed away in Florida and her remains were laid to rest with her pets. A year later, Edward Clifton Jennings Jr. passed away, 
and in 2006, Barbara Joan Jennings passed away. Terry, Jeanette's only surviving child, holds a firm belief that her mother is indeed Mary Agnes Maroney. She expressed her lack of knowledge regarding the name Julia Otis and how her mother, Jeanette Burchard, came to be raised by Terry's grandmother. The circumstances surrounding these details remain unknown to Terry. However, she expressed sympathy and sadness for Mary Agnes's parents, acknowledging that they never had closure or knowledge of what actually happened to their daughter. Despite the unanswered questions, Terry reassured the Maroney family that Mary Agnes, or Jeanette Burchard as she knew her, was deeply loved. The relentless search for Mary Agnes Maroney in 1930 spanned decades. As of this year, 2023, the Maroney family has finally closed the horrifying chapter that haunted their generations for almost a century. But one question remained. Who was Julia Otis and what drove her to take little Mary Agnes from her innocent family? There are some answers we will never know. Let us know your thoughts down below.